Welcome to everybody, wherever you happen to be in the world. This year we've been very privileged, I think, to have heard from a number of very eminent philatelists and postal historians worldwide. And today um, is absolutely no exception to that. Jamie Goff, I think, needs no introduction to many of you. He's been a member of the Royal for over 30 years and a representative in California. He's a signatory to the role of distinguished philatelists. He's an international judge, an international exhibitor who has won numerous prestigious awards, including the Crawford Medal for his work on the uh, book on the UPU. That was in 2020. And I think it won another award, London 2022. Now today, and I think most appropriately, given the fact that we've recently celebrated Her Majesty's Platinum Jubilee, uh, he's going on to present us with a display about the worldwide recess issues of Queen Elizabeth II. So Jamie, over to you. Um, thank you for inviting me to share with all of you a collection that I am not widely known for having. But I want to share with you um, a collection I've not been well known for, in part because it's modern and most people associate more classical uh, with me. And um, what, what's interesting about this is that Back in the early 80s, I found a cover at a dealer's box and I was fascinated by it. Uh, you'll see it in this um, presentation. It was a, um, uh, a Swaziland item sent airmail to the Netherlands and it had the 10 shilling and a lower value on it. And the design was similar, but had some distinctly different things about it. But it was sent by um, what the UPU did called small packet. And I was fascinated by it. I didn't collect the field, but I thought, oh, this is something that I've not seen before. So I bought it even though I thought at the time it was overpriced. Um, so that's how I began my collection of um, QE2. And I, as I studied more and more that item, I began to look for other items that also caught my attention with the image of Queen Elizabeth II. But what's, um, so for me, um, uh, Simon was talking earlier about back in the days when we were just stamp collectors. Um, I began very early. Stamp collecting is to me the poor man's art collection. Uh, this is a phrase I use frequently in a number of my presentations. And I think that's what attracts me to stamps is the beauty. And I believe that in the reign of Queen Elizabeth II, um, stamp uh, design and production uh, really got to the highest level it had ever been. And so that has attracted me and sustained me in 40 years of collecting um, this field. Uh, even though for the most part, most uh, collectors didn't know I was doing this. Also, the other thing about collecting recessed issues of Queen Elizabeth II is that um, you, I always stumble, not always, but periodically I'll stumble on stamps that I had never seen physically before and I am awed by their beauty. And so it coincides with the fact that uh, Her Majesty is um, uh, a really, what was interesting about it is when I first started collecting, it wasn't so much the fact that the queen was on it, but it was a way for me to define the era in which I was collecting. And so, but as I've been collecting these issues, I've come to have greater and greater regard for Her Majesty. And so here we are on the 70th anniversary of her accession to the throne and as patron of our society. What's interesting about it is my first encounter with the image of the queen actually was not in the 80s, but in 1960. We had a, um, uh, a blizzard uh, Christmas week. We were all housebound uh, with cabin fever. It was uh, at night below zero Fahrenheit. And so um, I was getting stir crazy and I went upstairs to my sister's room 
and um, started looking around for anything of interest. And I found my sisters both had stamp collections. And when I saw these stamps, I was fascinated by the fact that my Aunt Emily was on postage stamps. And of course, this was explained to me later by um, my mother that this was not my godmother, Aunt Emily, but rather the Queen of the United Kingdom. And so it's funny that what got me into stamp collecting were in fact stamps issued with the Queen's image. Now let's go back to um, the Queen's accession. As all of you are aware, she became Queen on 6th of February, 1952. Uh, 20 days later, she had her first uh, photo sitting uh, with Dorothy Wilding. And then they ended up doing a second sitting in April, uh, April 15th. And out of these sittings, um, they chose 59 different photos for distribution. Um, and so you end up with one of the images being used for what British collectors called the wilding issue. Uh, but there were many other issues, which basically has created the opportunity for this collection. I've divided the presentation into three chapters. The United Kingdom is the home country, the dominions, and then the colonies, because they each have distinctive approaches to the Queen's image. Um, the United Kingdom doesn't tend to use images used in dominions or colonies. Uh, the dominions themselves each want to um, have very distinctive images of the Queen because she's not just the Queen of the United Kingdom. She's the Queen of Canada, the Queen of Australia, the Queen of New Zealand. Now, there have been many other dominions over time, but none that did recessed issues in the time period we're talking about. And then the colonies were largely controlled in the use of the image of the queen through the crown agents. So we start with the United Kingdom. Um, the photo on the left here is the official portrait that the United Kingdom has used for governmental purposes for at least the first um, 13 to 15 years or slightly longer. These are uh, proofs for banknotes and other uses. And then this is an enlarged proof of the um, Queen's image that ended up being used on the castles. Here we show um, surface printed uh, wilding image. And here we have the wilding image on recessed on a large express mail cover to the United States. And just so you know, um, you know, in the United Kingdom, you have um, two collectors who have amassed amazing collections of the castles. So I thought rather than do a poor job um, in trying to represent what Mike Roberts and Peter Shaw have been able to do, um, I would largely skip over the castles because most of the uh, people living in the United Kingdom, I'm sure are very familiar with those two fantastic exhibits. Here's the image of the queen, uh, the official portrait again, on some recessed commemoratives. And just so everybody's on the same page, uh, recessed is another word for engraving. So you run your finger across the surface of these stamps and you can actually feel the residue of the ink. And these are what they call um, imprimaturs, uh, which are registration sheets that have not been perforated and have been put into the files. Uh, by 1968, the castles were considered pretty much old hat. Um, people were getting bored with them. And so the post office held a competition. And as far as we know, these are the two um, engraved essays that were submitted by Andrew um, Restall. And uh, he used this image from the Dorothy Wilding um, uh, uh, portfolio uh, for his um, inspiration. Then, of course, we had um, Arnold Machen, who used this portrait, we believe, um, as inspiration, although he did take some of his own pictures, but Dorothy Wilding was the first to use this profile. And what uh, made Machen famous was that he took what is essentially a flat image and he gave it depth and texture uh, with his sculpting. And here we have the stamps. Uh, I know many of you have been seeing exhibits of the Machins, but I thought 
I would share with you uh, in this presentation some of the items in my collection that are eye candy. So here we have a production proof where they were testing the layout of the roller and they wanted to see if the stamps were uh, taking the impression on the plate and if they were being properly spaced. Uh, over here on the right side is the um, Arnold Machen um, Christmas card from one year. Uh, we think it's 1969 um, and with his autograph. And what's interesting is it's an Australian collector, um, Mark Desario, who upon seeing my QE2 presentation at the Collectors Club, pulled this out and gave it to me, uh, which is one of the nice things about so many people in the Royal is they're very generous uh, with their knowledge and um, even material. Here we have the, the crown or the five shilling value, very close to the issue of color, but not quite. Again, it's the production proof, and this time it's three columns. Here's a two column production proof of the 10 shilling. Uh, the color is fairly close, but not exact. Here we have the one pound. Here on the left, we have um, the old currency, um, pre-decimal pound, where they laid out the column. Um, and this is the stamp enlarged. The black is very close. And this is the new design that you're all familiar with uh, of the pound symbol on the second issue, the decimal issue of the Machins. Uh, there's a story about these and that a stack of them were stolen uh, out of a van on their way to the perforator. And so when you see these blocks, um, we don't really know whether or not they're imprimaturs, um, but most probably uh, the stolen stock. When the United Kingdom went decimal, um, they again had to do layouts for production purposes. Uh, the the pre-decimal stamps were in columns of five in the sheet, and the decimal became columns of 10. So this is a uh, column showing only six of the 10. There are two other pairs floating around, but um, I didn't have any interest in them because I couldn't get them on an exhibit page, even as big as my pages are. And that this production proof is in black color as opposed to the color of issue, which is cerise. Um, now what's interesting, I had to reconstruct this strip and so I, I kind of put it back together again. So the top two stamps here were bought separately from the bottom four. Then um, after the Machen issue had been out for, for a while in 1988, uh, the Newcastle series was issued using photos provided by Prince Andrew. And um, as you can see, they etched in the image of the queen um, but the etching really didn't take very well. And uh, the one pound value uh, uh, was um, depicting Carrick Fergus um, in a castle in Northern Ireland, which they printed in green. The two pound Edinburgh castle um, was in a color very similar to um, the stamp as it would be issued, but notice that even though it's a darker color, the etching image of the queen doesn't quite take. It's um, not been popular among people who wanted a stronger image. So what they did was they changed the image of the queen keeping the castles and they used a silk screening process to create the head of the queen using the original Mary Gillick um, uh, image of the queen from the coinage issued upon her ascension. And um, what they did was they didn't want to show the detail because it's too small of an image. And not only that, but the silk screening uh, allowed for optically variable ink to help thwart um, counterfeiting. When that issue was coming to an end, um, uh, Enskede, the printer in the Netherlands, uh, took the dies for the 1999 commemorative booklet for the Machen issue, and they presented the post office with some of these color trials, suggesting these be used for the high values. What's interesting about them is I had owned all four, but 
Um, I have an arrangement with Steve McGill where we help each other in our collecting interests. And so he ended up taking two of them and I kept the other two. Now let's talk about dominions. <clears throat> Um, as I mentioned earlier, each of the dominions wanted distinctly different images of the queen to demonstrate their personal relationship with the queen, a relationship not dependent on any um, uh, liaison with the British government. And so the first dominion was Canada. And so what's interesting about Canada is that um, in, in 1867, they had a conference um, uh, in London, and they met with the uh, members of British Parliament, and they were pushing for Canada to be called a kingdom. But the members of the British Parliament were not too keen on Canada having that um, title. And so they settled on Dominion. And um, then later on, Australia didn't really like the title Dominion. So they became, they're called a Commonwealth, even though legally they're a Dominion. And then by the time New Zealand um, was given its dominion status, nobody really cared what it was called. So here we are with Canada. They issued their first definitives and they were very proud to have a Canadian photographer go to London and photograph the queen. They wanted their own distinctive image. But what's interesting about this series is that um, it was unpopular because nobody thought it really looked like the queen. And the central violet one is the master uh, die proof with no value um, for um, the stamp. And it was then replicated across several other values. So here's the two set where um, the value has been impressed into the uh, die. Then a month later, um, already not having a great success um, to its name, Canada Post Office used this image um, whereby uh, somebody, uh, Joseph Karsh, photographed the queen. They created a 3D image um, and then produced a stamp. But this stamp was even less popular than the definitive issue. The definitive issue only lasted in, um, on sale for about a year before they came out with um, this Dorothy Wilding uh, photograph that they deployed. But even here, it's kind of interesting to me that um, here we see the Queen's image. And if we compare them, there are subtle differences between the large die proof and the actual issued stamp. And the image of anybody is always going to be subject to interpretation by the engraver. So here we see the same image used for Jamaica prepared by Waterloo and then compare that to the one created by the Canadian banknote company. This item shows a, a very unusual use of the four cent. What's interesting is a side store step into postal history in, and you'll see this in the postal card book, um, that Canada um, had a warning to postmasters in their postal manual that didn't get corrected for uh, almost 100 years. And the warning was that postcards from the United States were not to be accepted in Canada. So the Canadian uh, postmasters thought that even with UPU reply cards, that Canadians had to add letter rate postage to American reply cards for them to be sent back. And this is the only country in the world that Canada did that to. It's funny because Canada and the United States had uh, perhaps the oldest bilateral postal union in the world, but this is one item that they would not accept from the United States. Here we have other images. Um, over here, we have a royal visit from 57. We have a royal visit from 59 when the queen went to North America to meet with President Eisenhower for the opening of the St. Lawrence Seaway. And this is one of the more popular um, paintings that was done, and it was done by Pietro Anagoni, and we'll see more about him later in the presentation. This is one of my favorites, a large die proof of the Queen uh, for the stamp that was issued to commemorate the Commonwealth meeting for the heads of government and state. Now we get into Australia. Australia um, decided to stick with 
an official uh, portrait of the queen that had obviously been blessed by a lot of people, not uh, least of which is the queen herself. And they issued three values. And just for fun, I don't know if too many people have ever seen a near complete sheet of both panes together, but I threw that in as again, eye candy. Um, the Australians uh, have a tradition of issuing um, large dye proofs that they then cut down and put into, mat into matting. And that this, um, we'll see a few of these, but here's something very interesting. Here's the profile again that was used by Machen. Here's the Machen stamp as it was engraved by Czeslaw Slania for the 1999 booklet. And then you can see some uh, similarities in the stamps because of the profile. And this, this Australian engraver, Donald Cameron, was a very high level engraver. Um, here we have uh, a, an example where an Australian sculptor tried to create more texture for another issue uh, of Australia. Here we have again, large dye proofs um, that were cut down and put into matting. And just so you know, I've, I've reduced the size of the matting for these scans. Um, these are a lot larger like this one. But notice too that the queen, the, the various um, dominions seem to find a crown, I mean, not a crown, a tiara that they like, and then they'll, they were using it over and over again in different photographs. Uh, Barron Studios in Australia produced quite a number of the QE2 stamps uh, in terms of design, photographs and design. And then in this instance, the tiara is the Grand Duchess Vladimir tiara. <clears throat> there we have um, the queen showing the girls of Great Britain and Ireland tiara. And what's interesting, uh, I should mention this, is that this uh, tiara was done for uh, the Princess Mary in 1893 as a gift on monies that were collected throughout the British Isles um, uh, in order to make uh, the tiara. And so it is called Girls of Great Britain and Ireland. And here it is used on a large cover. New Zealand, um, the official Portrait of the Queen was used for uh, their first definitives. Uh, New Zealand opted for something that nobody else has used, and that is a picture of the Queen uh, during the trooping of the color um, that she does typically every June uh, for her birthday. But uh, notice here too that the engraver changed something. The photo that was used for the Queen shows her looking off into the distance but somebody told the engraver to change her eyes so that she's looking at the viewer. Here's some more New Zealand. They used a profile for the official stamps. And this is a tag on official mail uh, carrying letter rate mail um, to the United States. <clears throat> now let's look at the colonies. Um, the crown agents were very fond of the tiaras and provided all of these as options to the different colonies. So we have the girls of Great Britain and Ireland, which uh, that tiara was made in 1893. We have the King George IV, that's not a mistake. It's not King George VI, it's four diadem uh, for the official portrait. This is um, the headpiece that the queen seems to like a lot. We have the Grand Duchess Vladimir Tiara, which Queen Mary, wife of King George V, bought from an uh, impoverished uh, Russian noble. We have the uh, bear heads left and right. And then we have, as one of the options when her head is bare, uh, where they put a crown over the frame holding her, her head, um, Pietro, Pietro Anagoni, an Italian painter, um, which I've already shown you a large dye proof of that Canada did with, his, with that particular image of the queen. And then Anthony Buckley, where Queen Alexandra's Coco Schnick, uh, which was made and presented to Queen Alexandra um, before her ascension to the throne as a princess um, married. Um, and the, and this, this uh, tiara 
was created in 1888 as a gift for her on the 25th wedding anniversary. Now we get um, into an image. What's really interesting about the uh, omnibus coronation issue <clears throat> is that the same design was used by 62 different members of the Commonwealth for 106 stamps released all on the same day and coordinated by Crown agents. Two printers were Bradbury Wilkinson, which got 10 contracts, and De La Rue, which got 52. What's interesting, uh, and you have to feel sorry for Bradbury Wilkinson, is they're the ones who actually did the design and master die that was used for all of these stamps. And over 1 billion of these stamps were released on the same day. Here you have a crown agent's printer's selection that would be shown to various um, uh, ministers for posts or postmasters general or others um, on the possible images for them to select. By the way, the, the colonies were not given these. The agents were purposefully told not to uh, leave them with the clients. There we have a profile of the queen where we see her uh, right cheek and she's looking off into the distance. And these are some of the images. So you end up where the field is filled in, where the field is empty. This is a large die proof. These are large die proofs. Here she's looking in the opposite direction. And again, uh, the field can be filled in or blank. Here we have the queen um, not looking so much profile, but off at an angle, showing the right cheek, and that comes in different colors. Again, we're seeing the girls of Great Britain and Ireland tiara. Here we have the official portrait, and there are subtleties when these are used. You think they all look the same until you study them. And here, um, the queen's image is totally within um, the frame. And here we have um, a definitive frame where the tiara is, or the diadem is actually breaking into the frame. And so this gives you a little bit of a larger image of the queen's effigy uh, in the stamp design, which is uh, why some of the artists like that. Here we have, again, uh, angled position. Uh, this is one of my favorite stamps. It's the uh, Kenya Uganda Tanganyika one pound, and it comes in various shades. You know, Gibbons lists two shades. Uh, I think if you look at this and compare it, we'll see that there are actually three at least, and I've seen others. And this, by the way, is um, a tag to samples by second class airmail to Canada, paying one pound five shillings, which was a lot of money in those days. Because in this time period, in the uh, 50s and 60s, uh, postal rates started to actually decline. So as time went on, you find less and less opportunity to find high values on anything, whether it be the piece of a parcel or a parcel tag. <clears throat> this is showing uh, Southern Rhodesia had issued a one pound revenue stamp which was more commonly used for revenue purposes. So finding the one pound postage stamp used for revenue purposes is not as easy to get as you might assume. Uh, the one pound Cayman Islands, when you look at the stamp, uh, it, it's just such a beautiful color. Um, over here, you have a more reduced image used in Singapore um, on the back of a banker's foreign exchange draft and the amount of fees being paid for that draft are considerable. Here's an interesting uh, example of, again, um, a QE2 stamp where the purpose is being changed when Tristan da Cunha had the volcanic eruption. They, um, they vacated the island. The postmaster brought his stock of stamps. The postmaster on St. Helena decided to help him um, get rid of his stamps by selling them as postage stamps of St. Helena. This is very rare in the world of postal administrations where um, one administration is willing to take stamps of another one for use in its own territory. You know, we're used to seeing occupation stamps and other kinds of things like that, but this is an unusual uh, wrinkle. 
and this is first day, and this is a one of those very unusual commercial usages. I've only ever seen three commercial usages um, of this set or these stamps um, ever. And I've heard that there's a parcel tag out there with quite a number of these on it, but um, I haven't been able to find it yet. <clears throat> Here again, we see the image in different places. I have the um, five shilling Bahamas, because this is in a time period when airmail rates were declining. Although um, I do have the 10 shilling, I just wasn't able to find it in one of my many boxes of accumulations over the last um, 40 years. Uh, Nyasa land, this was interesting. These stamps were produced as an economy measure because the Federation of um, Rhodesia and Nyasa land was falling apart, but they badly needed stamps. So they went to the printer and said, um, what can you do for us? And the printer came up with the idea of printing the revenue stamps and overprinting them postage as an economy measure to get them through the remaining two months of 63 before the surface printed stamps would be issued in 64. And it was in 64 that Nyasaland land changed its name to uh, Malawi. Um, these stamps, while they are available in mint, this is the only of the set that I own of inscription blocks is the only set that I've ever seen. And finding them on cover is very, very difficult to do. And here we have a um, British government uh, letter parcel from Gibraltar with the one pound used on it. And this had to be one heavy sack by 1960 to uh, be paying this kind of postage uh, back to the United Kingdom. Now, what happened was um, the printers would uh, be approached by various um, stamp designers, such as the Goemans, and say, I need to design stamps for this colony, and this is the image that I want, and I need um, 10 of them, and I need them in the following colors. So the printer would produce off of a, um, a roller these kinds of images or they would produce them effectively as, as large die proof if they had to actually prove, pull out the master die. But this is on gum stamp paper um, by Bradbury. And this is on um, proof paper where, again, the designers would cut the images out. And you'd say, well, why are they cutting them out? Well, because a lot of the stamps, um, well, not a lot, but a fair number of the stamps that were being done were hand painted. And um, this is the same size as a real stamp, as the stamp of issue. Um, the image of the queen was cut out of one of those uh, gum labels and adhered to um, this diff cardboard. And they always use this kind of um, gray cardboard. And then they would lay out Chinese white and each and every one of the perforations were hand done. And they were using brushes uh, that had anywhere from one to five hairs on them in order to do these uh, designs. And needless to say, these hand painted designs tend to be unique for each of the values. And this is an example of um, uh, a proof that could have been produced for one of the designers uh, to be cut out and put into a hand painted design. Just for fun, um, here's a, a, a chunk of the set for Jamaica um, where there are different values and all of these are hand painted. Needless to say, the hand paintings tend to be unique. <clears throat> great eye candy when you see them in person. Um, now here are some uh, proofs when it comes to independence overprints. What's interesting is many of us think of overprints as being haphazard in their placement, but with uh, Jamaica and many of the other uh, colonies of the period, placement of the overprint was very specific. So whether it's up high as here, or whether it's down low, um, this was specific and, and the designers and the post offices were very concerned about the placement of the overprint. So it had to be very exact. What's interesting about these issues here is that some of them 
uh, the placement of the overprints were changed later. And three of these stamps that you're seeing um, actually are truly unique uh, because they're on a watermark that does not exist for that placement of the overprint. And here's the higher value where they did a slightly different layout. And they actually did a large die proof, which they cut down in order to uh, try out and see how this overprint would work. Here's a large registered envelope. I love these things. And um, the stamp was originally designed by um, Goeman. Um, and it's a very kind of um, stylized design of animals. But when the post office looked at it, they said, well, uh, you know, this is a picture of animals on the plains on a moonlit night, but that doesn't look like night. It just looks like it's green. So when the post office ordered the stamps, they ordered it in kind of a gray black so that people upon seeing it would realize this was from a nighttime um, design. It's interesting how you begin to learn these little subtleties that go into stamp designs. Here are large die proofs of the various components of the St. Kitts, Nevis, and Anguilla. Um, cent uh, centenary of stamps on Nevis. And these are the central vignettes for these values. And this is the image of the queen that was used to set into the um, key types for each of the values. Here we have again, a side view of the queen. Um, notice that uh, the crowns uh, do tend to differ here. The queen's um, profile is contained within the shield of a uh, native tribe. Um, and then, but the crowns are a little bit different um, depending upon the colony and the artist's desire to create a difference. Here we have um, uh, the crown agents came up with the idea of a key type master die that they hoped would be used by many colonies. And it turned out it was only used by the first one, Tristan de Kuna and that may have affected the other colonies' desires to ever use the design um, because Tristan is pretty much out of the way and very small. Um, here we have a large registered envelope with two of the 10 shilling and the five shilling. And this is the only commercial usage I've ever seen of the 10 shilling. Um, here we have the scientific survey on Gough Island. And for in case any of you are missing it, Gough is my last name. And the island was discovered by my four times um, great grandfather, who was a Royal Naval captain. And the island subsequently got named for him. Here we have again profile uh, looking off. Um, we are seeing her right cheek. This is a 20 shilling or one pound value. This envelope was rather heavy and it contains stuff that broke through the envelope and they used uh, um, margin from some QE2 stamps to seal up and repair the envelope. Here we see the QE2 stamp of Rhodesia Niasalan being used uh, as part of a bulk postage due collection. So you can see that there's a lot of postal history opportunity uh, in the QE2 period for which uh, it's not well known. But again, I'm focused uh, here mostly on the designs. And here we have the queen looking off to the left. So we see her left cheek. And again, this is a hand painted um, essay, which is the same size as the issued stamp. And this is the large die proof for that stamp. So there's a lot of um, variety you can get when you collect um, QE2 period. Here we have printed on gum side, one of the more famous uh, examples for Rhodesia, and it was for Rhodesia and Nyasaland. And um, this is the issued stamp and this blurry um, light blue color, this is printed on the gum side. And what's interesting, this is the only known example of the printed on gum side stamp still on the envelope. There were about a dozen other envelopes, but collectors as they bought the envelopes, wanted to show used printed on gum side. So they soaked them off and in the process, the image came off the paper. So I've actually been offered 
uh, an example where the image has come off and it's really hard to discern that in fact, the image had ever been there. Here's a fun example of another QE2 issue where um, uh, the printers were given an order for 16,500 stamps to be overprinted 11 shillings. Well, the government printers in Sierra Leone um, didn't know why the post office wanted a value of 11 shillings, but the order, the requisition order was for 275 sheets. So they did what many printers do and they ran a bunch of trials and used up some of the stock um, and it became damaged. And so net of damaged stock, they had only 15,960 stamps, but they needed to come up with 540 more. So being ingenious in order to meet the requirement, the printers just grabbed some other stamps off the pile and they took the uh, one pound value, uh, overprinted nine sheets of them with 11 shillings in order to fill the total requisition order. So it's kind of interesting how the printer, it would not have occurred to them that um, this would become a highly sought after item and actually was not in keeping with the post office intent. Although one has to wonder what 11 shillings is as a postal rate, particularly in this um, era. Here we have Rhodesia and Nyasaland um, showing their coat of arms um, in the vignette section, but this one pound plus three shillings of postage sent newspapers by airmail to Sweden. Um, the wrapper on the left is the small packet wrapper. Um, I, can't, I haven't figured out yet how to present this on a page so one can understand that it's got an accordion-like effect because it was folded up neatly um, after uh, the box was removed. Uh, but we have the 10 shilling and the one shilling three. We have the queen's head not in a frame and in a frame. Here we have mixed usages of the um, uh, An Antigua and Leeward Island stamps used on a parcel tag. So you find these mixed usages. Here we have um, uh, some more modern postal history. Uh, the UPU required all countries to issue reply cards. However, after World War I, that requirement became a little more flexible. And so they allowed countries to opt for homemade reply cards um, in lieu of actually having to do print runs of reply cards. So here we see the outgoing card from Beshwanaland Protectorate to Papua. And here we see the response and that the cards were kept together in part because the, the original recipient probably didn't realize he could have separated the cards, but I'm glad he did not. So we have British Beshwana land used in Papua. Now here's the Anagoni design. This is the large dive proof that is associated with this Fiji stamp. And this was a large die, um, which I've trimmed down by the way, uh, significantly trimmed down. That was prepared for Hong Kong for its high values, but Hong Kong opted for surface printed using the image, but not to do recessed. Here's the image on the Antigua uh, presentations uh, imperfs. Here we have imperfs for the West Indies Federation uh, in 1958. And here's the first day uh, from the handwriting. It looks as if this probably was sent from somebody who is native to the British Caribbean. Because what you find is that handwriting uh, does tend to have geographic associations. Here's some more uh, Pietro Anagoni issued stamps. Uh, and here's the stamp being used on the back of a real estate transfer document, which is why you have such a high um, revenue use of these high values. Now we get into Anthony Buckley. Anthony Buckley, as you'll remember, um, did the uh, front view of the queen uh, looking forward for Canada. And here we have one of his more famous designs. Here um, from the, um, this is a, a segment of the plate uh, proof. This is a large die proof for Tristan de Cunha. Although I need to say that um, 
they ended up eliminating the lines that went through the name because it looked like um, they were um, trying to say it was not Tristan de Kuna, and that was the interpretation by the post office. So they eliminated the lines. They buffed out um, the uh, Tristan de Kuna and, and, and re-input it. Here we have the same kind of design for the Bahamas. We have on the right two panels, uh, we have pre-decimal. And what's interesting about this is that uh, it's a combination of recessed with the queen's image and the name of the country, but the rest of it is uh, lithographed. And that's kind of unusual to run it through those two processes. And here we have the, um, the key type design for the various values after conversion to um, dollars. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about the Bahamas is they got a little loose with their stamp issuing policy and collectors began to complain. So by the time this decimal, uh, this, um, decimal issue came into being and was ready to go out again, um, collectors were dropping their accounts at the current stamp bureau um, and they just were dropping the accounts. They were not sticking with collecting Bahamas. So in response to a lot of the complaints and loss of business, they decided that they would not actually accelerate a new issue, but they would just change the paper because who would notice, right? Well, what we find here is this stamp is the same as this stamp and I'm shining an ultraviolet light on them and you can see the 12 cent and in both uh, photos is not glowing, but the 15 cent is. And this new paper uh, became a problem after the issue was withdrawn from circulation and sale because um, uh, some of the stamps were, in, were on sale only five to six days before being withdrawn. So collectors didn't know about them in time. And here we have Tristan de Cuna where we have a currency conversion um, using again the Buckley photo with the queen wearing the Coco Schneck. And what's interesting, which a lot of people may not realize, is this particular tiara um, was designed um, for Queen Alexandra uh, based on one that her sister was wearing as the Tsarina of Russia. Uh, but it also has mobility. So each of those um, parts of the crown can actually be widened, creating more space between each of the segments of the crown. But here we are, this is the decimal issue. Um, that's been, they overprinted the pre-decimal issue. And these are the sheets of what were shown to tourists. So when tourists came off the ships, people would go, oh, what a cute little place. And they even have their own stamps. And so they would do a fair amount of business with the tourist trade. And this was so that tourists could see the stamps that they would be buying on sale that day. And then um, these typically leaked into collector uh, files uh, when the stamps were replaced by a new issue. And so that's it. Now, have we got any questions for you? Let me have a look. So far, Jamie, no one's asked a question, although Simon Martin Redman is providing some, some useful information. Uh, thank you for this, Simon. As we know, he knows a tad or two about Sarawak, and he tells us that Sarawak had a race day on the 2nd of June, and therefore it was a local bank holiday. So they issued the coronation issue on the 3rd of June instead. Okay. <laughs> Which is the only, I think it's, I think it's the only country of all that omnibus issue that issued it on a different day. Yeah, makes sense. Well, ladies and gentlemen, no one's asked Jamie any questions. So, um, Mike, uh, back to you, I guess. Okay. Um, they probably don't ask you any questions because you know all the answers backwards, probably. <laughs> um, anyway, look. Thank you, Jamie, for that fantastic, very comprehensive Maybe. and erudite presentation of a topic which I think is so relevant to uh, the recent Platinum Jubilee celebrations. Uh, I don't think many people will, well, perhaps they do, but there may be quite a few who don't realise how 
rare this so-called modern proof material is. Um, and you know that I know that it is very rare. Um, in many instances, it's considerably rarer than items which predate it by a hundred years. Um, <clears throat> again, I mean, I know that from my own collecting efforts. But to be able to cover the background, starting with the photography of Dorothy Wilding and the sittings of the Queen, and then go on to describe the work that was done for the Dominions, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, and then go on further to the colonies. This is all very impressive. The depth of the material, given its rarity, is amazing in itself. And there were more than a number of items which were, you describe as one-offs, but you know, um, how many of those are there? You showed us master dies, die proofs, and even a few odd large covers, which I particularly like. So thanks, Jamie. Thank you very much indeed. You've finished off the year of Zoom meetings to the Royal uh, with a fantastic, uh, impressive presentation of wonderful material. So thank you very much from everybody. Now, I'm not sure whether our president is here, is he, Mark? I don't think he is. Um, I know that Peter was going to go to Canada, wasn't he, for CAPEX? Yeah. So we ought to present Jamie with his virtual uh, certificate, if you've got it handy. We, I will. On, on behalf of the president, um, Jamie, uh, I think you understand the, the original of this will be in the mail to you, but I will obviously share the virtual copy of it, the electronic copy with you now. It tells me that you're seeing that. Yep. yep. So that is indeed the certificate of appreciation from the society. Thank you very much for your display today. Very interesting um, indeed. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Well done. Superb. Well,